Hello chicos, hello chicas. Today's video is going to be dedicated to a former student of mine, a legendary human, Faith. So I hope you are doing well, kiddo. And uh, on the menu today is going to be a book that I have been planning to review for an eternity. And finally, I got, got around doing it. So today we are going to discuss Chess Structures, a Grandmaster Guide by Mauricio Flores Rios. But as everyone knows it, it is the Pawn Structures book by Flores Rios, Standard Patterns and Plans Explained. Now, there is simply no other way to put it other than saying that this book is gold. And if I had to have one book with me to teach chess from, uh, of all the books I have, I, this would definitely be top three and very likely the number one choice for that purpose and likewise if someone wants to learn a lot about chess from just one source then Flores Rios's book is almost certainly top three and almost certainly better than second so what is it that makes this book so good first of all um, it covers all the major pawn structures um, that we can come across in chess I'm going to show you um, the content that uh, reveals to you the goods it's very cleverly set apart family one is d4 pawn structures as in when white has a pawn on d4 then it moves on to Sicilian Benoni Kings Indian French and what I really really like about the way uh, how he divided up the chapters is is that there is obviously overlap in certain pawn structures, so he calls certain pawn structures type. For example, the knight of type pawn structures. Now, those pawn structures can occur from the Sveshnikov, the Sheveningen, and so on. So he very cleverly created sort of umbrellas under which he brought a fair number of openings, but the structures are the same. Now, speaking of structures, the book is brilliantly laid out and it's really, really a user-friendly one in every respect. So let me show you uh, just one, which happens to be uh, the Nidolf type. This much is the text. You could say that it's almost certainly insufficient, but it's not the case at all. It's very concise. It's very much to the point and it gives you exactly what you need. Let me share you a little tidbit from the Nidolf type. So he talks a little bit about how it occurs. Uh, and then it says, this structure deserves careful study as the recapture, recapture after ED5. So he's talking about this pawn structure right there. When white plays knight D5, usually it gets captured and then ED. Uh, and we have that pawn structure. Let me have it up on the board. Um, so we are talking about this. Ooh, we don't have a board yet. We are talking about uh, the pawn structure with white having d5 and black having d6 and e5 pawns. So this is what he says. Um, this structure deserves careful study as the recapture ed5 dramatically changes the character of the game. Even players of the highest level transform their position with this uh, recapture without properly assessing their chances in the resulting position. Extremely insightful point there. This structure provides a natural imbalance and offers interesting chances to both sides. The main plans are, and then he goes on to white plans, black plans. Again, beautifully, concisely, very clearly explained. No mumbo jumbo, unnecessary talk, no complications, straight to the point. White wants c4, c5. On some occasion when black plays f5, we want to put a bishop on the b1h7 diagonal and play for g4. Black's plan, play for f5, restrict or undermine white's play of playing c4. Done, dusted. Then he talks about the bad bishops, which is really, really cool because it again shows that although the description is short, it, despite that, it's very deep. And he says that in this structure, it's typical that white's light squared bishop is really bad because of the furthest advanced pawn is on that color. And likewise, black's black bishop is also bad because of the furthest, furthest advanced black pawn is on uh, a dark square. However, he then adds the following, which is going to make this example really, really remarkable. Um, both of these bishops are considered bad according to classical strategic theory, yada, yada, yada. As we will learn in this chapter, black's dark square bishop is not that bad at all, whereas white's bishop is often restricted. And then 
he offers an example which I'm going to show you from the get-go so we are not going to start right here but we are going to get it from the start and I do consider this to be another strength of uh, the book that I really love it when middle game topic books start every single example from get-go because that way you have an understanding of how the game developed into that point when we identify the structure and then we follow the subsequent plan. So it's not just like dropping a bomb on us that pff, here is the position, do something with it. You actually see how we got there and I think that that also does help our understanding and our ability to better process and understand what's to come, uh, what is to come afterwards. So yeah, this is actually a not a night of game at all. This is actually a Sozin attack, which again shows how great um, the book and the author's thinking was too, that uh, he was brave enough to gather intel and examples from a very deep pool, because that way he could cover more. I really love it. So here we go, bishop takes, bishop takes, knight d5, bishop takes, very common. Obviously, ed, ed, check would pick up the c6 bishop with a favorable structure because then white's bishop would thrive, thrive. Um, whoops, it is easy. that was me pressing the wrong button, just the usual traditional mistake by me. So knight d5, bishop takes, pawn takes, pawn e5, and here we go. And right away, if you remember what he said in the... Um, introduction to the chapter, we right away see that black's position is bound to be slightly better here, at least slightly, because c4 doesn't seem to be a plausible plan here, f5 is, all I need to do is move the bishop castle, f5 is good to go, the b3 bishop is tragically bad, whereas we can see that although f6 is pretty bad, e4 is going to open up this bishop and boy is it gonna be a ripper. Now let's see how black turned this into an absolute masterpiece. Rook d3, queen d7. Um, covering b5, I suspect, preparing a5, a4. <laughs> Excuse me, rook c3, a5, very logical, a3, castles. It's definitely black who is calling all the shots and uh, white is defending. Rook c6, a4, bishop a2. And at this point, Black uncorked an absolutely genius strategic idea. A double positional pawn sacrifice b4, followed by a3, to ensure that White now has to play b3 and thus burying the bishop alive. Now, obviously, that's a really bad bishop, but that was already Black's doing by doing this pawn sack, followed by another. Know that he taking a3, rook takes a3 would have catastrophic consequences because after e4, black is going to dominate the dark squares. The heavies are penetrating on the a file. It is just not playable at all. So white decided to play along, lock in the bishop, and now black just unleashed the dark squared bishop. e4, g6, that was actually a bit of a meh rookie. It would have been more to the point and uh, a blunder in response and now white is completely falling apart basically white is playing a piece down and now we can see that white is actually losing the game in the middle slash a little bit toward the king side um rook d1 was played note that the logical rook takes e8 would lose to both rook e8 and queen e8 the idea being that after takes queen takes f6 among others the cleanest is probably the shocking queen g4 Wow, and now I'm threatening with rook d1 check followed by queen d1 check, all kinds of uh, of dirties are incoming. And if I pull my queen back to f2 to defend, then queen g5 check and I'm going to eventually um, get onto the d5 square like so when mate and rook are both hanging. I don't really want to go into the details of this because it's wildly tactical and a little bit off topic, but this was an absolute genius of a move. Um, Hector played rook d1, bishop g5 check, king back, and now the pile up and the penetration is just inevitable. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful game. Uh, demonstrating very, very clearly the points that the author highlighted. In fact, after rook e1, White already resigned and the cruel engine tells us that mate in six is incoming. And now I'm going to reveal a secret to you. The black player in this game was none other than the Hungarian 
uh, genius Richard Rihard Rapport. So yeah, good old Richie knows how to attack in chess. A remarkably clever game, a beautiful demonstration of the concepts that were discussed once again by uh, Flores Rios. Oopsies, that's an analysis line. So he mentions that c4 is a plan, white couldn't exploit or rather play for it. f5 is a plan for black, it wasn't needed. He talked about the difference between the bishops and that was the decisive factor. And he even said that even on GM level, when people enter this structure, they often misjudge it, which is exactly um, what happened here with the Swedish um, Grandmaster Johnny Hector. So <clears throat> this is roughly the structure and the idea of the book. The games are beautifully selected for examples. I really like the fact that the examples are quite rich in diagrams. So this game starts up here. We have got one, two, three and four. Three, four diagrams just for one game. That is, I think, quite generous. And in fact, this appears to be a pattern across the book. Most pawn structures have got two, three, four examples to back up the concepts to demonstrate the plan. And Flores Rios did a really, really good job of finding, once again, outstanding examples that demonstrate the ideas really well. As a matter of fact, kudos to the author here, he actually put in a fair few of his own games, many of which he lost. It takes a man and a half. Uh, to put games into your own book that you lost, but he considered them to be extremely instructive for that particular structure. So special kudos to him. And to make it an absolute masterpiece, at the very end of the book, the last chapter is exercises. And these exercises are absolutely and fundamentally based on the pawn structures that are discussed in the previous 22 chapters. Here I'm going to show you an example. This is uh, what he calls one of the King's Indian chapters. I don't remember um, what he exactly calls it. Let me just check very quickly. King, uh, the complex King's Indian. That's what he calls this pawn structure. I really like it. Um, and he refers to the one with uh, the pawn on d4 and the black pawn on e5. And the one where it's c4, e4 versus d6, c6. So he has got uh, quite a number of King's Indian chapters here too. And your task here, dear viewer, is to um, identify the and name the best move and the best plan for white. If you want to do that, please pause the video. In fact, this is one where there is multiple solutions. Um, the point is the e5 break, of course, where we would like to play e5 uh, to undermine the knight on c5, and it works like charm. After d5 comes knight takes c6, opening up the bishop's diagonal, and after takes takes, the dust has settled. White has got an absolutely dominant position. C6 is weak, e5 is wonky. The two bishops are slicing and dicing. So are the rooks. Easy peasy. However, there is another very typical plan, which is also very common for this pawn structure, which is the peace sacrifice, knight b5, takes, takes. Now, queen c6 loses the queen to rook takes d6, so let's not go there. Queen e7 is, I guess, a logical move. And after knight takes d6, we have a hanging rook and a hanging knight. That being said, after knight, let's say, bd7, I wouldn't even bother taking this rook. I would just play e5 and enjoy this uh, absolutely torturous scenario where all my pieces are just dominating black and black is uh, trying to grasp for air but not with a lot of success and he even has by the way the um, um, these test positions they are labeled with different levels and they range from level one to level four i believe based on difficulty which is another lovely touch just to make this book an absolute masterpiece in my opinion no chess improver should ever, um, you know, try to thrive and uh, go for their goals without coming across this book. It's an absolute must to have. The amount of knowledge that is condensed into this book is remarkable, which is exactly why I said what I said in the beginning, that this is definitely a top choice for me as a coach, and it should be a top choice for anyone who is serious about chess improvement and pawn structures in general is really such a core skill and core understanding 
there is no way around it. So once again, chest structures by Mauricio Flores Rios is an absolute must to have and the most certain five out of five star. I very highly recommend this book to anyone um, starting with club level quite high up. Um, trust me, you will not regret having this book. It is an absolute masterpiece. And um, yeah, I can't be happy enough that uh, I have this book and I can use it day in, day out for my chess coaching. And that's going to be it from me for now, folks. Please don't forget to comment this up, to like, to super thank me if you can. And I will be back with the next video soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.